You guys can have a seat. And children, you can make your way out this door uh, to Children's Church. All right, a great crowd there today, isn't it? <laughs> and if you're going to be in here with us today, in Big Church, we used to call it, right? Um, let me invite you to find a Bible and open to Revelation chapter 16. Now, if you notice the title of the sermon this morning in your bulletin, you're probably thinking, oh boy, this sounds like a fun one, right? Another difficult uh, dynamic here in the book of Revelation. But if you've been with us and you've been walking through uh, these studies with us, you know that there are lots of ups and downs, right? And so this is kind of part of the flow, and we, we ought to be kind of used to it by now. Uh, if you're here for the first time, uh, let me remind you, or let me tell you, that um, we are in a series on the book of Revelation, a series we've been in since July, and we're continuing to work through, and we will be in until the Sunday before Christmas. Uh, today we come to the 16th chapter, and I won't have time to review everywhere we've been so far, uh, but I want to do my best just to kind of bring everybody up to speed to get us all on the same page before we dive into this chapter. Again, Revelation is a long and complex story. It's a vision that John sees while he's exiled on Patmos. And as he sees this vision, there's all sorts of symbols, all sorts of images. And the story, again, long and complex. Uh, and I would encourage you, if you're going to be with us on through the rest of the series, to go back and to watch some of the earlier uh, sermons. You can do that. The series started on 7-7. So that's an appropriate day. It wasn't on purpose. It just uh, turned out to be that way. But if you go back to the July 7th uh, series, our sermon, that will give you some interpretive keys. I think that will help you um, as you walk through uh, the rest of this story today. But one of the key characters in the story is the one who is worthy to open the scroll. And as John sees him in chapter 4 and 5, uh, he is the lamb appearing as if he were slain. And he really is the center of the story. And he's worshipped in the throne room of God. More, more recently, we were introduced to other characters in the story. Let me remind you. A woman, a dragon, and beasts. Okay, so we remember that the woman represents the messianic people of God who are waiting for the Messiah to come. She's a pregnant woman, you might remember. And we learn that the dragon is out to get the child as soon as the child is born. You remember that? And the child then is snatched up into heaven. Again, this is Jesus, you know, living, dying, rising from the dead, ascending into heaven. And so we understand all of that. Again, it's a symbolic sort of language. And so the, the dragon is upset because he was unable to get the child of the woman. So now he's going after the child's offspring. Guess who that is? You and me. We're Christians, right? We're followers of the Lamb. And the dragon is out to get us. Now before you think this is, this is crazy talk, right? Crazy language. Remember, this is apocalyptic literature, okay? So John is communicating a message with symbols and images to help us understand what's going on. Are you guys with me so far? Okay. So, two monsters and two beasts, or two monsters or beasts appear in chapter 13. They are empowered by the dragon, and they stand in contrast to the followers of the Lamb. Now, chapter 14, we're reminded that the dragon and his beast will ultimately be destroyed, even though it seems like they're currently in power. And the question is raised to us, are we followers of the beast or are we followers of the lamb? Now last week John witnesses this powerful scene of lamb followers worshiping. You remember that in chapter 15? But at the same time we encountered seven angels holding seven bowls. And we're told that the bowls represent God's wrath about to be poured out. So we have our minds around this. Again, it's hard sometimes, isn't it? And, and, and I'm going to challenge you today. You're going to have to stick with me, okay? You can't let your mind wander off about what you're having for lunch or what you're going to do this afternoon. You've got to stick with this if you're going to understand it this morning. The lamb and his followers on one side, the dragon, the beast, and their followers on the other side. Good and evil. Powers of light. Powers of darkness. The powers of evil have been unleashed, and they seem to be destroying the forces of good. 
But in chapter 16, this seems to shift. I'm going to invite Kelly Rodriguez to come this morning. She's going to read the first nine verses of chapter 16. We're going to talk about those, and then she's going to come back and read again the the latter part of the chapters. This is verses 1 through 9. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go, pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land, and ugly and painful sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it turned into blood like that of a dead man, and every living thing in the sea died. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. Then I heard the angel in charge of the water say, You are just in these judgments, you who are and who were the Holy One, because you have so judged, for they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was given power to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify him. All right, thank you, Kelly. Now, before we dive into this text together, let me ask you the question, do you ever struggle with this idea of God's wrath? Right? I don't know about you, but I, I don't like it, right? It's one of those things that you look at and you go, I kind of wish that the Bible didn't have all this talk of wrath in it. But we can't ignore it, can we? Because in many ways, it is a part of the story of God. Now, in the 20th century, Christianity began to shift away from a God of judgment and wrath and began to favor really more of a God of love and grace. And we began to not talk about those passages that talked about God's wrath. In fact, many of the foremost educational institutions and their divinity schools began to view the Bible as kind of an out-of-date book. And they began to teach it in that sort of way. At the time, Richard Niebuhr, one of the 20th century's most famous theologians, described this transition. He he wrote this in 1937. A God without wrath brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. And that's how he saw kind of Christianity moving And while we might prefer this sort of approach, this is not at all the message of the Bible, is it? And it's really not the world in which we live. If we look around, many of us would say, there's evil in the world, right? And we can't just ignore the evil. Even though we may not want to talk about God's wrath, it's a part of the story. Now now think about the world since Richard Niebuhr penned these words in 1937. Consider the evils that have taken place from from communism to fascism to apartheid. You see, Richard Niebuhr knew that this kind of Christianity would not work in the world in which we live. So the wrath of God. What is God's wrath all about? N.T. Wright suggests that it consists of two dynamics. First, God allows human wickedness, evil in our world, and sometimes God simply allows that evil to work itself out and to kind of have its own destruction. That's one uh, element of God's wrath. A second facet of God's wrath is that God sometimes steps in in a more direct way and stops evil. And that's kind of what we're talking about today. But both are good. The first allows us time to repent and turn away from evil. The second one protects us from the consequences of unchecked evil. So look at what we're getting at here in Revelation chapter 16. Seven bowls being poured out. No surprise that the number seven, right? That's numbers all over the place. And we might have noticed that the bowls being poured out resemble other plagues. Did any of you catch that this morning? As we read of those bowls, what do the plagues in Revelation 16 remind us of? Anybody? You can speak out. Egypt, good. Exodus story, exactly. You see, in the Exodus story, God was saving his people, right? His people were in trouble. They were slaves in Egypt. And God uses the plagues as the beginning 
of a salvation story. And so we need to understand the plagues here in Revelation 16 as God stepping in. He's doing something about the mess that he finds his world in. Now God is not losing his temper. He's not acting in anger. He is simply just and right. He loves the world that he created and he will not let evil go unchecked. So he must act, and this is what he does. Let's consider the dynamic that we talked about back in September. Do you remember in chapter 11? Now, this is the quiz here for those of you who've been here with this in, during this whole study. Do you remember when John eats the scroll in chapter 11? What did the scroll taste like? Say it louder. Honey, good. And what did it do to his stomach? Soured it, right? That's an image here of God's wrath. God's wrath is sweet on the one hand because it's justice, right? It's God making the world right. It's God taking the things that are evil in our world and bringing destruction to those things. So it's sweet, but at the same time it involves death and destruction. And there's a sour element about God's wrath, especially for those who are on the receiving end of God's wrath. So in verses 1 through 9, the first Four plagues are poured out. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple, verse 1, saying to the seven angels, Go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. God is acting. God is moving in his love and in his justice. He is stepping into a world gone wrong. And let's look at the first four plagues. And then Kelly's going to read and then we'll talk about the last three together. Verse 2, harmful and painful sores come upon the people. Now, this sounds a lot like the Egyptian plague of the boils, doesn't it? The sixth Egyptian plague. We might also remember Job suffered a similar affliction, didn't he? He was covered with boils. Verse 3, the second plague turns the sea to blood. Again, sounds a lot like the first plague in Exodus chapter 7. I'll put this on the screen. This is Exodus 7. The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams and canals, over the ponds and all the reservoirs, and they will turn to blood. Blood will be everywhere in Egypt, even in the wooden buckets and stone jars. The psalmist reflects on Exodus 7. He says this in Psalm, 18, or Psalm 78. He says, He turned their rivers to blood. They could not drink from their streams. You, you see the imagery here? John's pulling into Revelation these ancient plagues that were a part of God's story. And as we read these plagues, we might be asking, why is, why is God doing this? We might even have questions of God's goodness. We might wonder, what's, what's he doing here? Why is he doing it? But verses 5 and 6 remind us. Look at what it says in verse 5. Then I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, just in case you don't know, you, God, are just in these judgments. You who are and who were the Holy One, because you have so judged. For they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. You see, especially if you're living in the first century, your friends, your relatives are being killed for their faith, right? They're being martyred. And you're thinking, where's God? What's he doing? Why is he letting this happen? And when the plagues come in chapter 16, it is God who is just and right, who is bringing justice to the evil. And then look at verse 7. A voice speaks in verse 7. It says, and I heard the altar respond. Now let's think about this for a minute. An altar talking? That seems kind of strange, doesn't it? But what does the altar represent? You might remember back in chapter 6, the altar is where the martyrs are gathered. And the altar is also the place where the prayers of God's people as incense go up to God, right? So we, we've got this injustice, the martyrs, those who've been slain for their faith, and they are represented by this altar. And so the altar is speaking here in verse 7. And the altar says, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. Now we could spend a lot of time here, but the short of it is that God is not losing his temper. God is not acting in anger. He is 
just and true. And His wrath is simply an outpouring of His nature. God cannot let this injustice go unchecked. Fourth plague in verses 8 and 9. The bowl, so how many have we got so far? This is the three, this is number four. The bowl is poured on the sun, and the sun scorches people with fire. Now, I know it seems weird, doesn't it? But remember, these are symbols. This is language that's describing for us things that are happening here. And you might remember the Egyptian plague, the sun was dimmed, but here the sun is intensified, and the fire that comes from the intense sun scorches people. Now, fire in the Bible represents God's judgment. So it's no surprise here that the sun is intensified and God's judgment then is poured out on the people. Now, as we look at the plagues here, again, we understand it as imagery. And the purpose of the Egyptian plagues was to reveal God's power. Pharaoh, when he experienced the plagues, what did he do? His heart hardened, right? And he said, no, I will not worship that God. Right? He refused. His heart was hardened. He did not understand God as one who had authority over all creation. He did not repent. He could have, could have given God glory. He could have said, he is Lord, he is God. We're going to worship the God of the Israelites. But he didn't do that, did he? And look at the response here in Revelation chapter 16, verse 9. They were seared by the intense heat and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues. But they refused to repent and glorify them, him. Now, if you're reading this literally, you're thinking, how could you be scorched by the heat of the sun and then refuse to give God glory? How does that work out, right? Again, this is symbolism here. It's imagery here. God's judgment is coming on them, and they're refusing to repent. Let's continue with the last three plagues here, then we'll come back uh, and read, or we'll come back and talk about the rest of the whole, the whole chapter together. Revelation 16, Kelly's going to read verses 10 through 21 here. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. Men gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are spirits of demons performing miraculous signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him, so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne, saying, It is done. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on earth, so tremendous was the quake. The great city split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the Great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away, and the mountains could not be found. From the sky, huge hailstones of about a hundred pounds each fell upon men. And they cursed God on account of the plague of hail, because the plague was so terrible. All right, thank you, Kelly. Now stick with us here, because we're going to walk through these. We've got four already, and number five ties into number four, doesn't it? The sun was intensified in four, and in five, darkness is a result. Again, sounds like the ninth Egyptian plague here. The result is that people gnaw their tongues in agony. So rather than repenting and calling out to God, they're cursing God. Look at verse 10. Men gnaw their tongues in agony and curse the God of heaven because their pains and their sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. So there's this dynamic here. and We've got to keep that in mind here. 
These plagues are being poured out. God's wrath is being poured out. And there is the possibility that people could repent, right? Turn to God. But they don't. Their hearts are hardened and they refuse to repent. That's a key, key dynamic here. Now, number six. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. And its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Now, we talked about this dynamic back in chapter 9. In the first century, the Roman Empire was a powerhouse, wasn't it? I mean, everybody looked to Rome and said, who can go up against Rome? Who can defeat Rome, right? But there was another empire called the Parthian Empire, and it was in the east. It was east of the Euphrates River, and Rome was unable to conquer the Parthian Empire. And there was a fear among the Romans that one day the Parthian Empire would rise up and would overtake them. So they kind of feared this nation or this empire toward the east. But there was a natural barrier, the Euphrates River, that kept the the Parthian Empire at bay. But look at what it says here. The river would be dried up. It's kind of like the natural borders that we might have that would protect us from another nation collapsing. Maybe if we lived in a city in in the medieval times and we had a wall around the city, we would feel that that wall would offer protection for us, right? And all of a sudden, if those walls crumbled to the ground, we're shaking in our boots, right? Because we're not sure what's going to happen next. The Euphrates River drying up to the Christians in the or to the to the Roman Empire would have been A dreadful thing because they would have feared the kings from the east coming. So God is bringing his judgment, his wrath on the people of the beast. So six bowls poured out we've covered so far. Now you might remember when the six seals were, or the seven seals were open, there was an interlude between number six and seven. And scholars say that verses 13 through 16 here are an interlude between the sixth and the seventh bowl being poured out. Let's consider this dynamic here. Verses 13 through 16 as kind of a let's stop and think about this sort of section, okay? Look at verse 13. Then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Now, you might be thinking, oh, yeah, I remember there was a frog plague in Egypt, right? Maybe this is a tie-in to that frog plague. I'm not sure if it ties in directly with that, but frogs were certainly considered unclean animals. And the frogs here are representing the evil spirits, the unclean spirits, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Now, there's the three kind of unholy trinity characters there. Dragon, beast, false prophet. Now, this is the first time in Revelation that the false prophet is mentioned, but you're going to see that false prophet mentioned over and over again as we get into the rest of the story and as we complete the story together. But but no doubt, all of these images, these three images, dragon, beast, false prophet, prophet represent the evil one they represent the evil empire who is out to destroy the followers of Jesus now let's look at a few other verses here that demonstrate what's happening here look at verse 14 there's they are spirits of demons performing miraculous signs they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for battle on the great day of God Almighty so they're performing signs And they're tricking kings into battle. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew 24. 24. Jesus said, For false Christ and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even even the elect, if that were possible. Do you see how Jesus describes these false prophets, these evil ones? He says that they will perform great signs. They'll have miraculous power, but their chief goal is to deceive. Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. He said, In every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing, 
they perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Do you see the dynamic here? The evil one, the dragon, the beast, the false prophet is a deceiver. He's a liar. He says things that are not true in order to pull people into his game. And so he's going out and he's tricking all of these kings to battle. And that's what's going on here. Let's move on to verse 15. As we read verse 15, uh, we might notice something different about uh, the NIV translation and maybe some other translations. And the NIV translation just kind of reads on, uh, Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake, keeps his clothes with him, so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Now, I want to put the NTE version up here because I want you to see this here. What does this version have that the NIV doesn't have? Anybody see it? Say it. Parentheses. Exactly. And maybe you have a translation that actually has the words of Jesus in red. And if you do, this particular verse might be red. The words of Jesus. So, so right here in the middle of chapter 16, we have Jesus speaking, right? interjecting into this kind of strange story and this might be a message for us it might be something that we can read and go wait a minute this isn't just about the people who are having plagues unleashed on them it's about us it has something to do with you and me and look at what it says i'm coming like a thief who's coming jesus is coming god's blessing on those who stay awake are you sleeping during the sermon this morning? Just in case you are, you need to pay attention, right? I know it's a little warm in here. Maybe you kind of been dozing off a little bit, but you've got to stay awake. Now, it's not talking about staying physically awake here. It's talking about being spiritually awake, right? And it's using this image of a warrior or soldier who might be in battle, and he would go into his tent and he would sleep at night. Now, the warrior, who is not very careful, might pull off all of his clothes, all of his gear, get on his PJs and climb into his cot, right? But what happens if he's attacked in the middle of the night? He's going to be left naked, right? He's not going to have his armor. He's not going to have his gear. He's going to be in trouble. And this is the sort of language that Jesus is using when he describes to us to stay awake, to be ready, to not be caught naked now that sounds kind of funny we think about that but but really again he's not talking about physical nakedness here he's talking about spiritual nakedness how could we be spiritually naked how could we live our lives in a way where we would be unprepared when jesus comes Jesus comes to make the world right. The beast is there with all of his tricks and all of his deceptions. And he's ready to take us into his fold, right? And if we're not careful, we'll be pulled in. If we're not careful, church, we'll be sucked into the ways of the beast. And I think that's important here. It's a great uh, interlude here in this. Jesus' words right in the middle here of chapter 16. Are we walking around spiritually clothed? That's the question. And let's continue here. I want to get through this chapter, but I want to warn you that we could spend the rest of the afternoon in this chapter. There's a lot here. And I don't have time to cover it all, and I, and I won't have time if we're going to get out of here. Because you'd be ready for your afternoon nap if I walk through this uh, piece by piece. I won't, I won't do that to you. But I want you to notice something here. Look at verse 16. When they gathered the kings together... To the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. How many of you ever heard that word Armageddon, right? In popular culture, this word has become synonymous with the end of time, okay? But that's not what John's thinking when he writes this down. I want to show you another translation. This is the NTE translation. And look at how that is translated. And they gathered the kings together at the place which in Hebrew is called Mount Megiddo. So which one is it? Is it Armageddon or is it Megiddo? Now, here's the deal. Scholars have debated this. And again, there's all kinds of interpretations on what this means. But many have understood the word Armageddon as the Greek word Harmageddon, which is a real mountain in North Palestine. And it's just outside this city called Megiddo. Okay? And there were battles 
throughout ancient times that were fought on this battlefield. And so it became, in the Jewish mindset, a symbol of battle, and particularly battle between good and evil. So I don't think that he's talking about a real place necessarily here. I think he's bringing in this imagery that all the Jews in the first century would have known, would have understood as this battle between the forces of good and evil. Again, John, I think, is speaking in symbolic terms here. He's not pointing to a place on a map where this particular thing is going to happen. It's really more about the evil forces, the dragon going out and getting all the kings of the earth, tricking them into battle and bringing them in to fight the followers of the Lamb, which we're going to get to in a few chapters, okay? We're going to see how this all works out. And just spoiler alert here, it's not really a battle, okay? You're going to see what happens. I'll leave that there and let you figure that out as we, as we get along in the story. But John is simply pointing to this description of the evil one and the way in which he works in our world. Okay, there's number six. Let's get to seven. The seventh bowl is open in verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his bowl in, into the air. And out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne. Out of a temple means it's God's voice, right? It's coming from the throne. And it says what? It is done. It's completed. It's finished. Now, the word, or the number seven, literally means to be complete, right? To be whole, to be perfect. So, in verses 18 through 20, we then have a description of an earthquake Great cities in the, of the world coming to an end. Certainly, the first century readers would have had Rome in mind when they're thinking of this world, this uh, city crumbling. All coming down, all coming to an end. The evil systems of the dragon are going to be undone. Again, we need to understand here that this is symbolic here. And again, a lot of people have taken this chapter, okay? And, and I promise you, you can go online and read all sorts of interpretations on this chapter, right? And people have said, well, it really means this particular nation in this particular time. And here's the date that it's going to happen. You know, everybody's pulled together all of these theories about what this means. And again, I don't think John's intending for that here. I think what John is saying here is that God's in control. He's coming in. He's taking out all of the systems in our world. The economic systems that are evil, the social systems that are evil, the political systems that are evil. Those systems of the beast are coming to an end. And again, in the first century, those systems would look different than they look in 2019. And maybe in another hundred years from now, there'll be new evil systems out there that this would apply to. You see, what John is saying here, again, I don't think he's outlining kind of a timeline or a plan for the end of the world as much as he's saying God's in control, God's the one in charge. And one day, God's going to show up, and these bowls are going to be poured out. And in the same way that he was saving the people of Egypt, that was a real historical event, by the way, he is going to save us, and he's going to care for us. He's not going to let evil run rampant forever. We, like, we leave off here in verse 21, again, with a huge hailstorm. And you need to understand that in ancient thought, a hailstorm was seen as God's judgment. So God's judgment here being poured out and the people not repenting. That's what we see here. Now again, we could spend all day unpacking this and trying to relate this. But I hope, I hope I've helped you understand a passage that you probably would not just pick up and read uh, during a devotional time, right? You'd probably read this and go, I don't even know what this means. I don't even know what this, I, I don't understand this. But as we walk through it together, my hope is that you've learned how to read this story. And, and if we can read it and we can understand it as the symbol that it is, it has tremendous power. Not just for one day out there, but it has tremendous power for today. And as I read this story, you know, I say, what, what about us? What do we do with this? And I, I think the key verse in this, in this chapter is verse 15. That's a key verse. And it's the verse that you and I can take and we can say, this has to do with us today. What did it say? Behold, I come like a thief. 
Do thieves come announced? No. They come in surprise, don't they? Jesus is coming in a way that we don't expect him to come. When we don't expect him to come. And he says, behold, it, or sorry, blessed is he who stays awake. Stays awake. Listen, our world is going to sleep spiritually. It's happening all around us. I don't know if you read um, polls about, the, about church attendance, but it's almost, everyone is consistent in the fact they're saying people are going to church less and less people are considering themselves religious or, or, or Christians. That, that's happening in our world today. I don't know if you can feel it, but it's there. It's happening all around us. And it's not just in our church. It's in every church. People are just like, yeah, you know, I'll go to church when I can go to church. Not a big deal. I'll show up when I can show up. You know, it's nice to go at Christmas and Easter, but I'm not going to really prioritize that in my life. And everything else is becoming priority. And our world is going to sleep spiritually. And here in verse 15, Jesus tells us, stay awake. And then he says, blessed is he who keeps his clothes with him. <laughs> Again, we laugh a little bit because we, we picture people running around naked, you know. But, but it's really not that sort of thing. It's really more about being unprepared. When you go and look for your clothes, when the bullets are flying, it's not the time to get dressed then, is it? You should already be dressed. And so as we stay awake, as we keep our clothes about us, and again, we could talk about what does this mean to keep our clothes about us. I think it has to do with living as God wants us to live and, and, and studying His Word and living in relationship with Him and being prepared for when Jesus shows up. And we will not be, as verse 15 says, shamefully exposed. See, God's coming. He's going to come and make our world right. One day, the evil systems of our world will go away. The dragon, the beast, the false prophet. Now, next week we get, this, this is the teaser for next week. It's a prostitute, okay, is the image that John uses here. Riding on the monster. I mean, it seems crazy in terms of the imagery. But as we get into it, you're going to see what power it has. Because there's a lot of difference between a prostitute and a bride, isn't there? And we're going to get in that, we're going to talk about that next week. You guys, if we can get revelation, if we can understand it, if we can grasp onto the imagery, unpack the imagery, and make it not so weird, then it becomes incredibly powerful for how we live our lives, how we understand God. You see, revelation is not just this weird book tacked onto the end. It is a part of the Word of God. May we apply it to our lives today. We're going to come to the table here this morning and the table is another set of images images that Jesus used images again from the Exodus story the Passover story in which Jesus redefines the Passover his body broken for us his blood shed for us this morning during our time of response we're gonna come to the table and let me invite you if you are a Christian, to join us this morning at the table. We remember Jesus gathering with his followers on the night that he was crucified, the night before he was crucified, and he took these elements. These are, these are symbols. These are elements of the Passover meal, elements that they would use to remember God's salvation story in the Exodus. God saved them. God redeemed them. God unleashed them from captivity and brought them into a new place. And Jesus took these symbols and he said, this is my body broken for you. He said, take and eat it. You know, when we think of eating someone's body, that sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? But if we understand this as Jesus' body nourishing us, empowering us, giving us life, his body was broken for us. 
And then Jesus took the cup. This was probably the fourth cup that they would have consumed that night of wine. And each cup had meaning and it retold the Exodus story, the God's salvation story. But Jesus said, this is the cup of the new covenant. This is my blood shed for you. A different kind of salvation. You see, the, the, the blood of the lamb was painted on the doorpost and it kept the angel of death from killing the firstborn in every household in the Egypt story, in the Exodus story. But now Jesus says, I'm redefining that. Now this blood is going to cover you, cover your sins. It's going to be salvation for you. Take and drink it. Now that seems kind of gross to drink blood, doesn't it? But do you see here, we're not talking about drinking literal blood. We're talking about understanding Jesus' blood as life for us. Salvation for us. And so as we come and we take a piece of bread and we place it in our mouth, we're saying, Jesus' body was broken for me. I needed to live. His blood was shed for me. And as you take this small cup of grape juice and you drink it, you're confessing His blood shed for you. If you're a follower of God, If you would confess that today, you're invited to come. If you've brought an offering, there's an offering plate here. If you'd like to, um, if you'd like to take the elements, I had someone say to me, you know, we come down front and it seems kind of rushed and I grab the bread and I grab the juice and I just consume it really fast. Maybe, maybe you just want to take it and you want to walk over to the altar and you want to kneel down and just take a moment and reflect. Maybe you want to take it back to your seat with you and consume it there. However you want to do it. There's no, no rule here on how you have to do this. But you can take the elements and you can go somewhere and you can, you can reflect for just a moment before you take it. But I want you to remember his body broken for you, his blood shed for you. And if you want to take some time to pray during this song, you do that also. You come now as God would lead you.